You know, we have got about 25 participants, but I'm sure you'll have plenty of participants as we proceed. Uh, so we'll start on time. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to today's RP monthly CMA webinar. Uh, I'm Dr. Vemur Murthy, the program director of the webinar. Um, I think is Dr. John Lovita here? Usually he would like to have some, make some remarks, otherwise he'll be joining us. So today's topic is echocardiography and lung ultrasound in COVID-19. Uh, today's question and answer session will be moderated by Dr. Soumya Naravetla, a cardiothoracic surgeon and director of thoracic oncology and structural heart, Springfield Heart Surgeons, LLC, Springfield, Ohio. Thank you, Dr. Naravetla, for joining us today. Thanks now, very much. It is now my the biggest privilege and honor to introduce our esteemed distinguished speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Navin C. Nanda. And actually, he is one of my mentors. Uh, Dr. Nanda is the distinguished professor of medicine and cardiovascular disease, University of Alabama at Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama. He's a pioneer in echocardiography and cardiovascular ultrasound, and he is considered the father of echocardiography and modern echocardiography by many organizations, both national as well as international. Um, he is such a humble person, but his contributions are, you know, just, um, um, they, they are so profound. He is the first to discover the pulmonary valve by echo and this has also led to the development of pediatric echocardiography. He's the first one to diagnose dextrotransposition of the great vessels by echo in pediatric patients. The first to diagnose a bicuspid aortic valve by echo. He invented the treadmill exercise echocardiography, introduced the color Doppler to the United States, developed currently used techniques for semi-quantification of the mitral, aortic and tricuspid techniques for sacred valve regurgitation severity. He invented the technique of uh, transpharyngeal and uh, transgastric ultrasound. He developed the clinical technique of live, real-time, three-dimensional transesophageal echocardiography. And he pioneered the use of echocardiography in cardiac pacing, several, many, many, many more accomplishments. He has about 1,000 scientific publications or 500 original peer-reviewed papers, 13 books on echocardiography, and which have been translated to Italian, French, German, and Turkish languages. And he has written a comprehensive textbook on echocardiography, which is supposed to be an, an internationally renowned authoritative book on echo. And he had several recognitions and several countries have recognized him. Several organizations have recognized him as the father of echocardiography. The Russian Society of Cardiology, Chinese Medical Association, Mexican Society of Echocardiography, Emirates Cardiology Society, Indian Society of Cardiology, Indian College of Cardiology, Cardiological Society of Cardiology. I can keep on going, mentioning at least another 10, 10 to 15 countries. And uh, needless to say, he has been uh, recognized by various uh, international organizations uh, for his accomplishments, contributions, and uh, excellence in, uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the discovery of uh, the modern art and science of echocardiography. It's now my privilege, again, uh, to welcome uh, Professor Navin <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Thank you. Shall I go ahead? Please. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vimuri Murthy, for uh, very, those very kind words. Uh, I'm really very flattered, at the same time very humbled, and uh, kind of uh, made me feel a little bit old that I'd done so many things in the past uh, four or five decades. <laughs> so that's interesting. Well, let's go on with the topic. Uh, we know we are going to talk on uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. As you know, it was first reported in Wuhan in late 2019, and about five to 10 percent of patients need intensive care. is very highly infectious. As a matter of fact, in Italy, 
uh, there was a time when 60 to 80 patients per hour went in an emergency room. So there's no, no place for them. And now we are also expecting a second wave. And uh, what's even more interesting is if you look at the hospital workers and their families, they account for one in six of the hospital cases. So it's really something uh, uh, which comes right home to all of us. Uh, what about echocardiography? What are the indications for echocardiography? Well, if you look at the echocardiography, uh, the indications are if you have hypoxemic respiratory failure and the symptoms are out of proportion to X-ray findings or CT findings, shock, heart failure, chest pain, acute coronary syndrome, abnormal EKG findings, thromboembolism, melanin arrhythmias, or you have markedly increased biomarkers like troponin uh, I, then that is an indication for echocardiography. And I know right now the indications have even expanded further. I'll talk about that after very careful consideration uh, because you don't want to avoid, uh, you want to avoid inappropriate use, especially when it comes to uh, the echocardiographers who are going to be doing echocardiography. They are at risk uh, for getting uh, the COVID infection. So that's something. Uh, 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 also, one needs to do a focus exam, spend minimum time with the patient, and many measurements on echocardiography can be made later on. So you just go in, take your images, and make the measurements later on. And you can also use point of care ultrasound equipment, which is much smaller, cheaper, and easier to carry, and more importantly, easier to sterilize, plus can be kept uh, in that unit uh, specifically for uh, COVID patients. So that can be that is something very important to do. Uh, you have to avoid transesophageal echocardiography as much as possible because there is aerosol risk, and you perform it uh, only, for example, if the patient has a very poor acoustic window on the transthoracic uh, exam, then only you go for TE. So that's done very, very rarely uh, in COVID patients. Uh, this is to show you a probe which can really be covered, uh, which you can put a gel on it and covered with the cover. We, you can use it for the next patient. So uh, when it comes to some of these probes, they're easy to use. And you have, this is an example of a POCUS, which I'm holding one handheld pocket echo machines, and that can be used. But if you want to get a little better quality pictures, go for a little larger one, which is something like the size of a laptop that you can see here. So that is POCUS. So you can use these small machines uh, to quickly examine uh, these patients. Uh, what about echocardiographic findings? So they are actually abnormal in 60% of patients, about two thirds of the patients. And get many findings. You can get increase in the chamber size, like the left ventricle, left atrium, but more importantly, the right ventricle, because as you know, uh, when the patients are on a ventilator, the right ventricle will dilate. So you'll see actually right ventricular dilatation and also right ventricular dysfunction. Now we have been looking at the systolic dysfunction of these, which is the inward motion of the walls of the ventricle. But now we are also looking at uh, at the longitudinal, uh, longitudinal actually uh, shortening of the ventricle. In other words, the base of the ventricle, both ventricles, right and left ventricle, they move towards the apex in systole. The apex doesn't move much. And so this longitudinal motion is also very important. And you can calculate the longitudinal strain by looking at the difference uh, in the length in systole. There's another way to look at uh, the function of the heart. As a matter of fact, uh, many times in COVID patients, the global logic which actually decrease much more much before the ejection fraction becomes abnormal so that's something very important to think about look for the global longitudinal strain and actually some of these findings uh, they correlate with edema in acute myocarditis uh, which you can see on the cardiac magnetic resonance imaging and of course, if the patient develops acute coronary syndrome, as you know, there are these small vessels, you get trauma in small coronary vessels, and that can actually cause acute coronary syndrome, like an acute myocardial infarction. And there you will actually get regional wall motion abnormalities. So if you see regional wall motion abnormalities, you immediately think in terms of coronary stenosis. But remember that stress cardiomyopathy, the patient having a stress, any type of stress, 
uh, can also cause some wall motion abnormalities. So really you have to differentiate uh, between the two as much as possible by taking a good history. So sometimes stress cardiomyopathy can mimic uh, regional wall motion abnormalities also. And, and uh, when it comes to already I mentioned about the decreased uh, um, RV function, well, RV has two walls. One wall is common to both the septum, is common to both the left and the right ventricles. So many times you want to look at the right ventricular dysfunction, you look at the uh, systolic dysfunction of the free wall of the right ventricle. And also when you look at the uh, speckle tracking echo, the global longitudinal strain, longitudinal strain, which is the motion of the base towards the apex, again, the free wall becomes very, very important. And when you have actually pulmonary thromboembolism, sometimes you get McConnell sign, which means the apex of the right ventricle would contract well uh, as compared to the mid and uh, basal portion of the right ventricle, which is different when you have cardiomyopathy or when you have myocardial infarction, where actually the apex being the distal uh, wall uh, is the first one to get infected. So that is very, very important to look at also. Uh, one can look at the IVC size, especially in patients who are not on PEEP, uh, positive, you know, pressures uh, and that given a right apex, so we have to give patients more fluid. Uh, if it's very large and not collapsing well, that means the pressure is in the right heart, the right atrial pressure is very high. And again, you can look at uh, a myopericarditis, you can get pericardial effusion. And sometimes these, some of these patients may need ECMO uh, when the ventricle is very, very poorly functioning. And at that time, when it comes to the placement of the cannulas for ECMO, ECMO is very helpful to make sure one of the cannula is in the aorta and the other, other part of the cannula is in the ventricle. So that's also very, very important. And of course, if you have a uh, previous echo, this is very helpful because you may get a patient with LV dysfunction, but that may be something pre-existing. Maybe, maybe the patient had cardiomyopathy before he developed COVID. So previous echo becomes very useful. So these are just a summarize, summarization of uh, the echo findings in COVID. And uh, this one just to shows the uh, uh, it, it, it will not play right now here, but uh, it just shows you that the ventricle has three components to that. One is inward motion. That's where we come with the inward motion of the walls of the ventricle, that's the left ventricle, and that's where you get ejection fraction. And then we have the longitudinal strain, which is the most base uh, base function. They're very important, as any cardiac surgeon will tell you. When they look at the heart, the heart is twisting most of the time. Uh, so that is important, but that is something more difficult to categorize, but we can certainly categorize the inward motion, ejection fraction, and the base to apex motion, uh, which is the longitudinal strain, uh, longitudinal by speckle tracking. Uh, uh, here it is coming up. Uh, for example, if you look at the uh, second picture here, uh, you can see the base is moving towards the apex here. If you look at the uh, first picture, with the marker is R, there's an inward contraction of the ventricle. And so this is to give an idea of how the heart moves. And so the twisting function is not shown here, uh, which is more difficult to characterize, but it has been done uh, by echocardiography also. And this is just to show you a patient, uh, patient with a pulmonary embolism. And we are looking at the right ventricle here, because it's dilated, does not contract very well. And if you look at the apex, it will be contracting better than the base, the corner sign. And then actually you look at the free ball strain here, normal strain in the free ball, uh, the normal strain is minus 20 percent. So the apex to the base a proportion, I mean, uh, if you look at the ape, uh, base to apex length, in system and diastole, it, uh, it will be 20 percent. And if it decreases to so less than 20 percent, then you know there is dysfunction uh, of the right ventricle in terms of uh, longitudinal motion. So that's very important to look at. Uh, this is an interesting patient just to show some thrombi may form in these patients. Uh, but just to show a patient here, here is the thrombus in the left atrial appendage. This is a transesophageal echo, left atrium. That's the mitral valve. That's the left ventricle. And this is a patient who was just undergoing coronary artery bypass. And we, by mistake, I mean, just by chance, we found this thrombus. Patient had a int, uh, history of uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in the past. And uh, the surgeon said, well, the thrombus is like the tip of a finger, not very mobile. So maybe shouldn't do anything. And we thought he should go in and, and really take the thrombus out. He thought he'll have to open the heart for that. Bypass is done from the surface. But the thrombus is own mind. You can see the thrombus just uh, on its own, moved from the LA appendage, went into the, into the left ventricle, through the left atrium, and then out into the aorta. And if you miss the thrombus, uh, you'll see that in slow motion also. So that way you don't miss it. So here it is again, very big thrombus. 
And so thrombus, this is the best uh, two-dimensional technique we have through a multi-plane transesophageal echocardiography. And the thrombus didn't look very large at all. I mean, uh, on, the, on that basis. But if you look at the thrombus, it's sort of much larger. It has a different shape. And now it is going down into the ventricle. And if you look at the aorta where my hand is, you'll see that the thrombus will be right into the aorta and past, uh, will go into the systemic circulation. So some of these thrombi will go, will be formed in the in uh, COVID patients in the right heart. And if there's a PFO, uh, they will migrate into the left atrium and actually potentially embolize. So just give an idea. Uh, the reason to show this also that three-dimensional echo is much better than two-dimensional echocardiography. Although in COVID patients, we don't have much time to do three-dimensional echo because there's a three-dimensional echo, you'd see the whole thrombus because the whole of your the whole of the image of the left atrium, left, uh, left ventricle uh, would be uh, encompassed in 3D uh, uh, data set, and you'd be seeing the whole thrombus. But here, and there'll be no argument with the surgeon saying the thrombus is small, but two dimensional echocardiography can actually misinterpret uh, uh, or actually underestimate uh, the size of a thrombus. So here is a thrombus again uh, showing you going from the left atrium into the left ventricle and then into the, into the aorta here. So just to, uh, now in this particular patient, uh, well, the surgeon was sweating, but he did the cardiopulmonary bypass. He didn't have to open the heart. And then we had very smart surgical residents who actually palpated, found that the left femoral pulsation was absent. So they knew where the thrombus was and they went and took out the thrombus. I'm not sure the patient did very well. They, I don't know whether they told the patient or not, said the patient did so well afterwards. Uh, but th that's, that's uh, a very, uh, very uh, favorable outcome in this patient. It may not be favorable in other patients. So just to show you, thrombi may form in COVID patients, and that's a major cause of morbidity and mor mortality in some of these uh, patients. So what is the usefulness of echocardiography? Well, if you can assess various cardiovascular complications, may help in guiding therapy, for example, in pulmonary embolism, ECMO, as I mentioned, positioning of the impeller cannula, looking at the fluid status by looking at the, uh, the inferior vena cava, may help in hypoxemia and high PEEP ventilation management, looking at the RV dysfunction, poor cardiac output, helps in assessing the etiology of shock, maybe, maybe they, we can diagnose myocardial infarction, may help in deciding the need for cardiac cath or coronary angio, especially if you see wall motion abnormalities, and you can actually monitor the right heart pressures, uh, and uh, also combination of troponin I and PA pressure by echo may help in determining the prognosis and mortality in some of these patients. And you can also do vascular do Doppler and scan for DBT in the, in the lower limbs. And that's, again, you can do that with echocardiography. And of course, you can exclude gross valvular stenosis regurgitation, which may be present uh, before they developed COVID. And very important also, you can follow up with echo after hospital discharge, because as you know, some of these patients remain symptomatic even after hospital discharge, especially athletes uh, who need echocardiography to make sure they don't have any, any cardiac dysfunction. Uh, that's very important for athletes. They get echoes uh, very often after they recover from uh, COVID. Well, what about the troponin? And what is the relationship to echocardiography? Uh, as you know, the uh, increase in troponin is considered sign of myocardial injury irrespective of other etiologies, which could be toxic, immune-mediated, traumatic, infectious, bacterial, viral, and uh, increase in cardiac troponin is a is significant predictor of severe uh, COVID uh, disease. And as you know, cardiac injury may be triggered by thrombosis in cardiac arteries, as I mentioned before, with subsequent myocardial ischemia. Also, sometimes, not that often, you can get direct cytopathic damage to cardiac myocytes and endothelial cells by COVID-19. Uh, in the beginning, we thought the incidence was high, about 7% or so, but some other studies are saying the incidence is lower, actually something like 1.4, 1, 1.6%. 1. So here, actually, if you look at the Wuhan study, again, uh, mortality increased need for ventilation, and there's a study, similar study from Mount Sinai group also. So, uh, for example, uh, another study which has been done, uh, recently published actually in uh, this year and actually last month, uh, they did trans thoracic echo in 305 patients. Uh, this is a study is combining study from New York as well as from Italy, another medical center from Italy. And they looked at 305 patients and they did echo for chest pain, shortness of breath, high troponin, uh, acute syndrome by EKG, acute coronary syndrome, or suspected pulmonary embolism or stroke. These were the indications for echo. And they found major echo 
it is 65 percent of patients including uh, including global dysfunction also grade two or three diastolic dysfunction very cardly effusion also and again in the same number of patients about 60 about two-thirds of the patient showed myocardial injury by positive troponins and the in hospital mortality was about five times higher for those with versus without troponin and increased six times in patients with positive troponin and major TT abnormalities. So when you adjust for complications like acute respiratory distress, shock, etc., acute kidney injury, uh, it, it they found that TT abnormality, addition of TT abnormalities, addition of abnormalities by transthoracic echocardiography, increased in hospital mortality in hospital mortality, but this did not increase in patients with increased troponins and no TT abnormality. So now it looks like the TT should be done practically in all patients where you have increased troponins, because if you find any abnormalities on TTE, that means the risk is actually more than uh, three times uh, the risk uh, if, you do, if you look at only increased troponins. So now, the, as I mentioned, the indication for echo might have changed because of this study that you may want to do uh, echocardiography in all patients where you find high troponin. Now, of course, this is only one study, and this needs further validation, but at least it, it is tending to say that echo becomes more and more important uh, in these patients with uh, COVID. Uh, also, actually, here, they, 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 another study here, uh, I think also from New York only by Kim uh, uh, Ruski here, they looked at 510 patients and they found that uh, RV dilatation was more common uh, in men and mechanically ventilated patients. So adverse RV modeling was associated with greater than twofold increased risk for mortality. So one can do the transthoracic echocardiography, but look also carefully at the right ventricle for any increase in the right ventricle on any RV dysfunction is also associated with increased uh, risk for mortality uh, in uh, COVID patients. So that's something very important. So according to this, echo should be done in all patients with COVID-19, not just with suspected cardiac ischemia, because it provides the important prognostic information, especially if patients have an increased troponin. And again, as I mentioned before, studies do need for the validation uh, with a much larger number of patients. And uh, uh, I mentioned about uh, uh, sports leagues, they do PT in athletes after recovery from COVID, especially uh, if they have positive antibodies and or any symptoms. Uh, so this is just something uh, one can look at. You can look at the troponin measurements here. Uh, if the troponin levels are increased, uh, which means there is myocardial injury. So if there is myocardial injury, then you can look at other inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, ferritin, D-dimer and pro-calcitonin. Pro you can do the EKG to the three things. You look at other inflammatory biomarkers, look at ECG changes, for example, ST segment elevation or depression or conduction disturbances or low voltage. And then you do a transthoracic echocardiography to look at all those echocardiac abnormalities which I described before, mainly affecting the left ventricle and the right ventricle, both systolic and diastolic dysfunction, as well as enlargement. And these three things, if you have all these three things, they all go for increased in hospital mortality. So again, transthoracic echo becomes very useful in addition to EKG and inflammatory biomarkers uh, in patients where you have actually evidence of myocardial injury, uh, which uh, means there is increased troponin levels in blood. Cardiac involvement in COVID, uh, as I mentioned before, it was supposed to be 6 to 7 percent, but now it's supposed to be 1.4 percent, but there is a direct damage in those 1.4 percent to cardiac myocytes and endothelial cells. That's very important to know. That can be direct damage uh, to micro cells. And of course, there's heart failure, permeambulism, stress cardiomyopathy. Stress cardiomyopathy is very confusing many times because you look like the, um, the apex may not be contracting very well. So you think in terms of acute coronary syndrome, uh, but this is the, the coronary arteries may be completely normal, and this may be due to stress cardiomyopathy because of increased adrenaline in some of these patients. And this becomes difficult, but many times you have to do a coronary angiogram uh, to in, uh, exclude uh, stress cardiomyopathy. So that's something I wanted to make sure. And also when it comes to arrhythmias, also another indication, and arrhythmias can be catecholaminergic induced. Uh, they can also be due to hydrochloroxine, which uh, you know, uh, 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 they, that can also produce uh, you know, um, QT prolongation and ventricular arrhythmias. And uh, 
Other stressors are like cytokine storm, multi-organ failure, as well as electrolyte imbalance. Uh, so that's about echocardiography. Now, next we need to go to lung ultrasound. Now, with the reason I'm talking about lung ultrasound, because you can use the same probe to look at lungs. You are looking at the heart and the lungs are right next door, uh, right there, and you can actually do lung ultrasound and that be becomes also very useful. And uh, if you have, the, uh, the heart occupies a very small portion of the chest here, right in the kind of a uh, little bit on the right side on the left side here, uh, but the rest of it is all lung. So you can actually divide the lung into many zones. Look at the uh, may, uh, look at the anterior clavicular line here and the posterior clavicular line. And then you have the mid-sternal line here. So you can divide into three zones, both the left and right lungs. And you can also look, go behind and uh, look at the lungs from behind also. And now usually the lungs will not, any ultrasound does not penetrate the lung. So what you get is an artifact because the lungs are very high uh, acoustic impedance, there is no penetration. Uh, the ultrasound will pen penetrate water, will penetrate actually chest wall tissues, soft tissue, but not the lungs. So what happens usually when you, uh, when you have, when you uh, place uh, the ultrasound probe uh, anywhere on the lung, you actually get uh, reverberatory artifacts because the lung actually reflects the ultrasound from the lung, there's no, there's no penetration. And so you get these actually transverse lines uh, you first actually you see the pleura. Most of the time you can see the pleura because the pleura is very superficial structure. So this normal pleura, very thin, and then you get actually these transverse lines, uh, which we call A lines. These are trans these are normal artifacts produced by normal lung. But if you have water in the lungs, like for example here, so here are the A lines here. You can see the A lines, and when you have water in the lungs, that produces another type of artifact. You get what you call these. Uh, uh, you know, comet type artifacts here, and they can be individual or they can be actually they can collapse together. So whenever there is water in the lungs, you'll get this. So if there is a the pulmonary edema from, I mean, the cardiac edema, I mean, from cardiac cause, or there is pulmonary edema, for example, from um, interstitial lung disease, uh, you will get these lines here. So you all immediately tell, it immediately tells you there's some pathology of the lungs, and therefore these are called as B lines. In, a, uh, in contrast to A lines, which are transverse lines, you can see them here also in motion. Uh, so that's uh, something you can easily tell there is water in the lungs or not. So right in the pleural. Now remember that ultrasound will only tell you there's water is superficial. It doesn't tell you anything what's deeper down in the lungs. So that is something to remember. Only superficial part of the lung, but it can be any superficial part of the lung, lower lobes, middle lobe, etc., cetera, uh, will tell you there is water in the lungs. Now here is a, a different, same, a comet type artifact, they are actually collapsed together. So they are, it means there may be more water in the lungs when you see this type of lines here. That's another possibility. And then if there is consolidation, you get this type of artifact. You get something what looks like a tissue. So here, very easy, you put the probe in the liver and you see the liver tissue. And then if the, this tissue resembles liver tissue, then you know there is consolidation, there's pneumonia here. So again, one can get pneumonia, uh, one can diagnose pneumonia by lung ultrasound very well here, just to the chest X-ray here. And also you get these little air bronchogram because the air here that produce artifacts. So they look like very bright artifacts, which are go together many times uh, with consolidated lung here, which is where you can see that very clearly here. So you can make a diagnosis of consolidated. Now remember, in COVID, many times you have actually lung consolidation and interstitial pneumonia and pleural thickening uh, more in the peripheral than actually lower down. So sometimes this actually aids this case. I mean, in a way, this may be to some extent, not really superior, but to some extent you can get this better with lung ultrasound, the superficial um, pneumonia and superficial interstitial edema, then you can get with even CT scanning. And of course, uh, when it comes to chest X-ray, uh, this uh, lung ultrasound is supposed to be more sensitive than chest X-ray in looking at these findings. So one can avoid chest X-ray in some of these patients by doing just a lung ultrasound can be done very quickly after you've done actually a cardiac uh, echocardiogram here. And of course, if you have uh, effusion here, you'll see water right from the behind. That's, no, that's easy to diagnose. And this part of the collapsed lung, that you can see very well with this. So these are somewhat, just to give an idea about scattered B lines, confluent B lines, which you saw, alveolar interstitial syndrome, which will have actually have water in the lung. So you'll get the B lines here. And one can also get actually pneumothorax, and sometimes pneumothorax is not easy to diagnose uh, on the chest X-ray. So normally you get a beach sign like this. Uh, this is normal uh, when there is no pneumothorax, and you'll get some sliding of the lung. Uh, 
uh, the lung actually will move as the patient breathes uh, on ultrasound also. And other times you get actually this type of sign, not a B sign, but the irregular sign here, the stratospheric sign. And this actually tells you that there may be pneumothorax, which is again a complication uh, in uh, COVID patients. So in COVID patients, you can diagnose uh, water in the lung, edema. Uh, you can look at consolidation, uh, pneumonia. And you can also look at the pleura. The pleura may be uh, irregular or maybe thickened. And that again is much easily seen on lung ultrasound than even by CT scan. And that is one of the signs of COVID. Uh, in fact, sometimes you're not sure because as you know, some of the tests can have a lot of false positives and negative, the patient's symptomatic. So if you do a lung ultrasound and you find the pleura is thickened or irregular, then you know the patient most likely has COVID or you have some other signs like B lines or this. So you know the patient has pneumonia. So one can diagnose that very easily. And sometimes you can make, make a diagnosis of COVID. It helps you make the diagnosis of COVID by just looking at lung ultrasound. Also, it is safe, quick, low cost. There is no radiation. It's reproducible. can be repeated many times, although you don't want to do that in COVID patient. Uh, can follow dynamic changes, lung consolidation, can see what's happening. And can identify the best site for puncture uh, when you have pleural effusion. And as I mentioned, can identify pneumothorax uh, which carries uh, poor prognosis. Uh, thing is, B lines detect liquid only in lung periphery, uh, lung periphery. And it was thought in the beginning it's not a risk factor for death. But if you look at all the lung findings, I'll show some studies here. We show that it's uh, got also prognostic prognostic value. Uh, here, just to show you, as someone, um, one of the studies done from China showing 91 patients and many patients, the research is very high. Almost two thirds of the patient, half to two thirds of the patient, will have all the other five, all the findings which I mentioned to you: pleural thickening, etc., confront B lines, scattered B lines, uh, and lung edema and lung uh, consolidation also. So, if you look at the lung ultrasound scores together with clinical findings, the arterial oxygen level without chest and CT findings, they may differentiate patients requiring intensive care, admission to uh, CCU, mechanical ventilation, or mortality within 30 days. Uh, very easy, it can differentiate these by just looking at lung ultrasound finding. You can just establish some scores and you don't have to look at chest X or CT findings. Without chest X and CT findings, before chest X or CT findings are done, you can look at lung scores, take into account some clinical findings and arterial oxygen levels. And actually that again uh, can differentiate, uh, can get an idea of which patients will require uh, intensive care. And this is very important because as you know, we have now tertiary centers like a wheel, uh, spokes in a central area, and you can decide which patient would need this central area uh, where you actually have uh, more expertise uh, and more CCUs and uh, more expertise in doing mechanical uh, ventilation. And I mentioned to you COVID-19 tends to affect peripheral and lower lung regions, which are accessible to lung ultrasound. And in this instance, it's more sensitive than CT for pleural and subpleural abnormalities. But of course, this not CT is very, very important in this way, very, very important but also CT means taking the patient to another site and findings are very important, but this can help initially uh, to, to even triage patients uh, which may need CT or may not need CT. And this is something important to think about. So there's no big headline, uh, very, just yesterday or so I read it uh, in the October issue of the emergency, I think it's the uh, American College of Emergency Physicians. And you say lung ultrasound with chest X-ray in COVID-19 diagnosis. I mean, it's true to some extent, because the lung ultrasound is more sensitive, as come 97.6% sensitive in this study compared with CX. It's an abstract presented by uh, Dr. Kendra Mendez uh, in Philadelphia at this American College of Emergency Physicians just recently. So, but it, it doesn't mean you go for lung ultrasound and don't do chest x ray. It doesn't mean that at all. It simply means lung ultrasound can be very helpful, very useful, can be a supplementary thing to other things that can maybe you can make an early diagnosis before they need any CT scanning or a chest X-ray. So this is where I was going to um, um, end my talk here so that we have more time for questions and answers. So what I've discussed here is that uh, more and more we are thinking, if you look at the uh, October, what is happening this month, and I mean last month, what is happening is that we are finding Finding that echo is becoming more and more important. Uh, for at the same time, 
becoming more important. They are very important supply uh, to other CT and chest X-ray as well as lung ultrasound actually uh, can help in, with clinical findings and oxygen saturation without taking into account uh, without taking into account uh, the um, uh, you know the CT and X-ray findings. Uh, it can actually help in the prognosis in this patient, and also it can help in diagnosis in patients with confusing symptoms because many patients have come with shortness of breaths and uh, uh, lungs may appear clear on auscultation and you don't know what's going on. Is this COVID or is this something else? And uh, lung ultrasound may be helpful uh, in those situations also. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Any questions for me? Uh, thank you, Dr. Nanda. I, it is uh, pretty, you know, we will have, uh, I'm sure now a lot of discussion, but I really appreciate your comprehensive and uh, uh, very informative uh, topic, you know, which is important, especially uh, during the COVID era. I got a couple of questions, Dr. Nanda. Number one, you know, uh, we, are, we are concerned about, uh, you know, somebody walking on the street, 20 year old guy, and then suddenly having the sudden cardiac arrest. And then we know that most probably there is an underlying mechanism, whether it is hypertrophic stenosis or whatever it is. You know? And so you think, uh, this is my first question. You think if you just go out into the population and then uh, target some selected communities and then try to do the um, sampling of the echocardiogram among the various uh, younger patients, what do you think is uh, going to be the incidence of the uh, findings which could lead, which could be helped with interventions in the early stage, number one. Number two, I know, you know, I, uh, actually, I, I think um, 2013 or so, the British uh, Society of Echocardiography and has come up with the guidelines uh, for practicing echocardiography and cardiac screening of sports participants specifically. And I think subsequently in 2015, the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology also came up with some guidelines. Now, what is the follow-up of these guidelines? Is it mandatory? in some of the, in, especially in some professional sports to screen these patients, because we see, you know, even one death suddenly happening is too much, you know, for a precious uh, sport. So I appreciate if you can answer these questions. And then Dr. Ravatla will take over the uh, question, the rest of the question and answer session. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, uh, the, uh, this, those are very good questions, you know, memory really great questions. Um, when it comes to the um, prevalence of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or uh, any other, reason for sudden death in this patient. We don't know really the uh, really the prevalence. I don't think the prevalence is that high. But as you know, even, as you mentioned, even, death is, even one death is very important. So that's why I think, uh, and we do see actually young athletes, uh, teens, uh, they're full-blown youths, and uh, suddenly they die. And then they, on autopsy, you find that they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the one way to exclude this, of course, uh, one can do an EKG on them. EKG may be abnormal, but may not be abnormal. Something very specific would be to do an echocardiogram. And if you do an echocardiogram, you can clearly make the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in these patients. And some of these patients may actually be going on with uh, uh, with some sort of a viral myocarditis, which may not be very, they may not be very symptomatic, maybe having some shortness of breath, they ignore it a little bit. And then you find that they have actually poor LV function. So, so it's important to do an echocardiogram on this, but at the same time, you need to think of the cost effectiveness of echocardiography. So there is, if there is some suspicion of anything, uh, you know, any shortness of breath or anything different, anything, any suspicion, then the indication becomes very, very important. But if there's no suspicion at all, uh, then I think again, it's a question of, do you want to prevent that one death or do you want to look at the cost effectiveness of the technique? So that's where, where the balance comes in. But I think it's very important uh, you 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 really can make a very good diagnosis on the basis of echocardiography, and uh, the other thing is about the same thing about the athletes here uh, uh, is the same same thing what you mentioned. Uh, so we do not know the prevalence, but uh, I think what you mentioned is very important. One death is important, and if you think in those terms, uh, then you'll be you'll more likely to do an echocardiogram on some of these patients. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Nanda. Uh, I, I have several questions, but uh, along with Dr. Murthy, I'd like to ask one non-COVID related question before I jump to the COVID related questions. Uh, in valvular heart disease and especially aortic stenosis, we often see septal hypertrophy that is not, or, or LV, I should say, left ventricular hypertrophy that's related to diastolic failure. 
separate from the hokum hypertrophy or septal hypertrophy that Dr. Worthy is referencing. Um, and this, uh, you know, as surgeons, at least we believe is, can also contribute to the gradient and create some left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Mm -hmm. And um, is there any protocols or I guess, what is your insight in starting to look at that more closely? Because in those cases where you have severe left ventricular hypertrophy, even if you replace the aortic valve, whether it's SAVR or TAVR, um, you still have that dynamic issue due to the uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Yeah, I think that's a very important question. Uh, the question comes up is that uh, you actually may have uh, uh, aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy combined in some patients. We, I mean, we reported that in 1980s, long time, 70s, I think, long time ago, and uh, and proven by biopsy in so uh, patients who had died. And that can happen. But I think one of the ways to um, look at that uh, is to do the strain, you know, do speckle tracking echocardiography. If you see decreased strain, now that can happen with aortic stenosis also, but if you see decreased scan, strain, quite a bit of decreased strain all over. And uh, you also see on echocardiography or on CMR uh, fibrosis, then you start thinking in terms of uh, hypotrophic cardiomyopathy. But one way I always used to, the way we used to identify uh, when surgeons used to operate on these patients was to tell them uh, to look at the outflow tract width. If they, usually when there is a concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, the left ventricular outflow tract does not actually decrease very much. It stays about 20 millimeters, more than 20 millimeters or so, two centimeters. Uh, but when there is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the outflow, uh, the because the septum, uh, you know, as you know, hypertrophy is much more, the outflow tract becomes narrow. So whenever we see this, we always tell the surgeon, feel for the septum, and when you replace the aortic valve, also do a myectomy, myectomy. But when once in a while the surgeon hasn't done that, and the patient has come up with a higher gradient than he had with the aortic stenosis. With the aortic stenosis, he had a gradient of maybe 90. Now the gradient is about 120 millimeters of mercury after surgery. And at that time, once you have replaced the valve, you cannot really do much because you, you, for you to go down in and do a myectomy, you have to go through that aortic valve again. So that becomes a problem. So that is another way. And the other thing, the also important thing to notice in these patients, the many patients with aortic stenosis may also have amyloidosis. So we are finding more and more some of these patients with amyloidosis addition. And this you can do by speckle tracking echocardiography. Um, there are other techniques of, of course, MRI and CT are more specific, but echo may help also. When you go for speckle tracking echocardiography, we find that the apex is well preserved. It's not very much involved with amyloid deposits. It's a basal portion uh, where there's amyloid. So therefore, uh, if you look at the, um, uh, at the ventricle in kind of a short axis, the bullseye phenomenon, where the apex is the center and the periphery is outside, you will see the strain is preserved in the middle. So it appears as red, uh, like we call it cherry on top, cherry on top of a cake, you know, kind of. So the strain is well preserved in the middle and uh, other not. So this sign actually is also very important to diagnose amyloidosis. So these are the three things which you look for. And again, when it comes to aortic stenosis, we used to many times go uh, for when, when the left ventricle actually fails or something like that. Uh, or when there is a left ventricle dysfunction. Now I think we find that if you go over speckle tracking echocardiography, you pick up this early subclinical dysfunction much, much earlier than you pick up when there is actually a decrease in the ejection fraction. Does that answer your, I mean, just trying to yes, answer yes, your yes, question yes, as, okay. as briefly as possible, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's actually a couple of people have asked a version of this question, but the basic question is, uh, and you alluded to it a little bit during your talk. Obviously, the text, you know, there is some risk for those people who are doing performing the echo on the patients. And at one point, you referred to the study that looked at patients who had chest pain, shortness of breath, elevated troponins, or risk of stroke. But then there was the other study that showed that everybody with an elevated troponin um, may warrant. Um, so having said that, what do you truly believe are the indications? Because if we, if we image everyone who has an elevated troponin, that could put you know, unnecessary people at risk. Um, if the only information we're getting is a worsening prognosis, like how can we smartly develop an algorithm where the echo findings could have some management impact other than just prognostic information? 
Well, I think the, it would have management uh, importance because you could, for example, if you see wall motion abnormalities uh, on the echocardiogram, they knew that his coronary arteries are involved. Uh, if you just see only right ventricular dysfunction, right ventricular enlargement, then you start thinking two things. You think in terms of whether the right ventricular, uh, the RV dilatation is on the basis of some pulmonary problem the patient has got, you know, immunomonia. On the other hand, if you see McConnell sign, uh, or if you see, you may see thrombi in the right ventricle, uh, right ventricle, you may see some thrombi, then you know there is a question of pulmonary embolism. So I think echo can be very useful in management because you can pick up thrombi in the ventricles, you can see wall motion abnormalities, and when you see wall motion abnormalities, you know this could be an acute coronary syndrome, so there's an indication for doing a coronary arteriography. So echo can be useful from that point of view. Now, of course, uh, uh, prognosis is important also, but these are the very imp important points. So pulmonary embolism, RV dysfunction, and again, uh, you, and again, fluid status of the patient. I'd seen a patient the other day with, uh, uh, with COVID where the IBC was so tiny, hardly we could see the IBC at all. So I called them up and say, well, this patient is need fluids, you know, <laughs> give this patient fluids. So there are very management issues. So when it comes to management issues, you are looking at the fluid status of the patient, you're looking for pulmonary embolism, you're looking for clots, you're looking for acute coronary syndrome, which could be because it's also believed that COVID may actually, um, cause the plaques in the coronary artery to be, uh, to be unstable, to be more unstable, or you can, you can have th a thrombi in the um, coronary vessels, and if you have thrombi in the coronary vessel, can create acute MI. So these are just to th off my head, three or four indications, very easy indication why an echo should be done. Now, you may not want to do echo in every patient with increased troponin, but if you have symptoms, if the symptoms, like I mentioned earlier, out of proportion, to what uh, what you see on the uh, chest X-ray and CT, then again, there's an indication for echocardiography. There's heart failure, obviously. Ch I mean, if you have uh, uh, in any signs of pulmonary embolism, you have a patient coming in with uh, uh, some leg pains, so you know, there's some peripheral emboli, all those will be indication for echocardiography. So many indications for echocardiography in these patients. Thank you. And uh, change is management. Have... <laughs> I'm sorry? And change is management, of you, obviously. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so there's and a lot not, of to forget, not to forget about ECMO, because some of these yes, patients yes. are so ventricles so dilated, and we know uh, there are some studies done showing that ECMO may be helpful in some of these patients. So when you do an ECMO, the echo is very important there because you need to place the uh, the uh, outlet portion of the ECMO in the aorta and the inlet in the ventricle, so it will be very sure. So those many many indications, yeah. Uh, as expected, there's a lot of questions about uh, the lung ultrasound. Uh, before I move on to some of those questions, I did want to remind everyone that Lung Cancer Awareness Month is November, uh, since this is our opportunity. And yeah. lung cancer is actually the number one cancer killer in men and women. And we're actually facing a little bit of an issue due to the pandemic because people aren't going in to get screened. If all cancer care is actually taking a little bit of a hit. So. Um, just if you can remind your patients to continue to get screened, usually in most centers, the screening facilities are separated from where COVID patients are getting their care. So there are safe ways to get um, screened for lung cancer and other screening tests as well. The first question about lung ultrasound was, um, do you have to adjust the depth of the ultrasound for lung imaging? Yeah, I mean, ideally you should take uh, actually a curved transducer uh, with a very high frequency, so you get better pictures uh, uh, in the near field, very close to the transducer, and the lung is, of course, very close to the, just next to the chest wall, so ideally. But uh, in fact, for practical purposes, you can also go for uh, regular probes that you have, and that they do quite a good job in looking at lung ultrasound, not as good as the curved special probes, uh, which you have, where you have actually, uh, where you adjust the focus, or the frequencies are just in such a way uh, that the focal point is actually in the near field rather than the far field, so you get better pictures. Uh, that, that's true though, uh, you have to adjust, but generally you don't have to adjust the probes that we have, you can just use the regular probes and that works as good, pretty good. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, is there a role of lung ultrasound in the diagnosis of PE? In diagnosing COPD? No, PE, pulmonary embolism. Uh, pulmonary embolism, uh, well, I don't think uh, the lung ultrasound uh, will, will help you very much in that. Uh, there's no studies done showing that you can uh, look at clots with lung ultrasound. I think there you need a regular echocardiogram. Uh, 
uh, to look at the to look at the uh, because you cannot see the pulmonary artery. Lung ultrasound simply looks at the periphery of the lung, peripheral portion of the lung. Now there may be a consolidation developing after after a clot has formed. You can pick up pick that up, but you will not be able to tell whether what is the reason for that consolidation. Whether it's due to a clot which has blocked the lung and resulted in consolidation, or whether it is uh, you know from something else, or pneumonitis. Thank you. Um, and I, sorry, I forgot to mention who those questions came from. The, the depth question was from Dr. Kaza. Um, and then the last, the previous question was from Dr. Kutula. Okay. Um, the next question is from uh, Dr. Ramurthy Chirinamula. He's, his question is, a CT scan is almost replacing COVID PCR testing in India due to expediency. Are there any one or two cardinal findings by lung ultrasound that can be pathognomonic of COVID? Yeah, uh, pathognomonic of COVID would be uh, pleural uh, thickening or irregularity in the pleura. That's, that's something uh, which you may not see very well on CT scan. Uh, I'm not an expert on CT scanning, but I'm told not can't see very well on CT scan, but you can see very well with the lung ultrasound. And of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the um, COVID tends to involve uh, mainly the peripheral portion of the lungs and not, the, not, not so much the inside portion of the lung. So that, that's where the lung ultrasound may become important. But at the same time, lung ultrasound cannot detect anything deeper down in the lungs, you know, any, any, any inflammation or any consolidation deeper down. So you balance the two. Okay. It can be, it can, the lung ultrasound can be something uh, you can use for a quick diagnosis quick and you know, some sort of an indicator. And, and that may tell you to go for more. Or if you find something on the lung ultrasound, maybe that tells you go for CT scan. And you can't repeat CT scan all the time, right? You can't repeat, go, go on repeating CT scans all the time, but you can repeat lung ultrasound very often. So if you have some consolidation, you can see what's happening to that consolidation with lung ultrasound rather than repeating CT scan. So in, from that, that way, it complements CT scan. and may reduce the need for CT scanning. So as a segue to that question, do you see a role for, do you, do you think COVID is going to make lung ultrasound more prominent in other illnesses like emphyema or lung cancer, you know, other, other non-COVID related diseases? Uh, it could, but, but the, the only, only thing, only limitation of lung ultrasound is that uh, you can only look at the periphery of the lungs, right? the peripheral portion, that's a big limitation. So when it comes to other things that you mentioned like lung cancer and all, uh, if it involves the periphery of the lung, maybe you'll find it, but many times, I'm not an expert on that, but many times I don't think it involves the periphery as much as the interior of the lung. So lung ultrasound may not be useful for that. Lung ultrasound is only looking at the top of the lung, so to speak. Think of that. Right. And <laughs> not the inside. Yeah. Right. But empyema and trapped lung is usually has fluid around the lung or consolidation. Right. And so. Yeah. Or effusion. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think our, this is probably our last question from our first lady. Uh, Dr. Nanda, do you recommend echo for people with COVID pneumonia who are non-hospitalized? Echo who are not, I'm sorry, didn't get that question. Do you recommend echo for patients with COVID pneumonia that are not hospitalized? So like an outpatient setting? Um, I don't know, I don't think we have much, uh much data on that, uh, but I, I would think uh, it, it still would be useful, especially if you go for echo and uh, lung ultrasound together, it probably would be potentially be useful, but we don't have much data on patients on doing echoes in patients who are not hospitalized. All the studies that I've seen are, are patients generally who are hospitalized, yeah. So we we'll lack data on that. I think that's um, all the questions that came in from the chat and we've just got a few minutes left and I thought we would give Dr. Jonah Lagoda a few minutes to make a couple comments because I know we didn't get to do that yeah. earlier, but thank we'll you very much, Dr. Nanda. We got one more question. I had the privilege of asking the last question. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, we discussed this before, you know, because uh, I'm interested in the resuscitation. And I know that, you know, uh, for any kind of ultrasound technology, you need a moving part. Yeah. If the heart, like asystole, you know, you can't do anything. In I agree. Relation, yes, you may do something, you know. You know, I'm looking from the viewpoint of the, the practical application. Uh, in reality, you know, in the real life, you know, 
because you know some of the my, my colleagues and research station experts and they said you know what maybe we should look into the prospect you know of uh, why this happened to this guy okay we know myocardial infarction is the most you know the important cause in majority of the cases what if it is pulmonary embolus or something so you know i think we had a discussion a few months ago so i think and i want you to tell the limitations uh, I, I'm, I myself, I'm not convinced, you know, if I'm doing a resuscitation on a patient, you know, obviously I don't, you know, ROSC is my, you know, the end point, you know, I don't uh, waste my time in putting the probes and all that, you know, doing the ultrasound. So what are the uh, limitations uh, in uh, when the resuscitation is going on from the, for the, uh, for this application of echo? Well, you are very right. One thing, uh, if the patient is dead, uh, you don't see anything at all. And this we found out, uh, I found out in 1971 when I was a toddler, actually. <laughs> I found out at that time. And we, we found that nothing, you have, something has to move uh, for you to see on the ultrasound. So that's one thing. But on the other hand, if you have done resuscitation, you can always do a, put the probe on and see whether the ventricle has started to contract or not. And that's important. Whether the, whether the ventricle has started to contract. And many times you see people who are going to go for cardiac arrest, uh, the ventricle will slowly, you know, uh, will, will be very, very poorly functioning and then go into arrest. And then when, you, when the resuscitation comes out, they again come back. So first of all, you see some smoke in the left ventricle because they're low, low flow outflow. You can get an idea that the ventricle is coming back. So that is, that's where the importance lies for ultrasound. But when there's nothing there, you won't see anything. Well, you know, I have to tell you this, you know, I think, you know, when we are talking about the high quality uh, compressions, you know, we really don't want to waste even a few seconds putting the probe there. Hey, guys, you know, let just wait, you know, let me see if the ventricle is contracting or not. So that's what I'm saying, you know, I got my own, uh, you know, um, questions, you know, about that. Thank you for answering that. No, you can, uh, you can put the probe, uh, 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 near the apex where you, I mean, you're not compressing uh, near the apex. You can put the probe in the apex and look at it but at the same time. Technically, it will interfere with the performance of the high quality compressions in the middle of the chest. You know, that is the practical limitation we have. We may overcome it, you know, we may just have some built-in, you know, technology where, you know, you can have use a device which is combined uh, with uh, the echo in the future, you know, anything can happen. So at this point, I think, oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naravetla. Thank, thank you, Dr. Nanda. And uh, Dr. John Lagarda, you know, please, okay. uh, you know. Uh, we started uh, the program at 7 o'clock. I, I, uh, I need to thank, thank both Dr. Sumayan and uh, Dr. Mamuri Murthy for uh, moderating this session and also all the audience who are there. Thank you very much for a kind attention. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. And... Uh, uh, I'm sure you know our CME programs are getting more and more uh, members are joining and uh, more interesting. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Navinanda. I know we, every organization need uh, leaders to see the limelight. I call them as the pillars. Dr. Nanda is one of the pillars of this API. Thank you very much, sir, for your support all the time. Uh, at this time, you know, I thank you, Dr. Navratla, for moderating the session. Dr. Vimurmuthi, always the best. And Vijay, can you can you uh, put the plaque on, please? Uh, American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin recognized Naveen C. Nanda, MD, for his contribution in the cardiology, acknowledging him as the father of modern echocardiography, and welcoming me as a member of AAP Distinguished Speaker Club. Sudhakar Janalagar, RP President, Vimurmuthi, Chair, RP webinar CME company. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, again, you know, uh, good, good evening and stay safe. Yeah, thank you all. Stay safe. Good night. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Dr. Somaya, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay.